The words Intel and Mini PC don't often go together these days. They may have pioneered the NUC format, but their mobile Core i CPUs of the past have had difficulty holding their boost speeds for more than a couple of seconds. What's the point in buying a high performance i9 if it acts like an i5? Keycom's new IT15 is powered by a top tier Arrow Lake Ultra 9 CPU, which trades off thread count for a smaller process node and new Arc integrated graphics. But can this help it avoid its predecessor's fatal flaw? Arrowlight might not have been that appealing for desktop PC enthusiasts, but in the world of mobile chips, it's a big step away from the older Core i series. The chip in this mini PC is the new Ultra 9 285H, a 16 core model that offers 6 full performance cores along with a total of 10 E cores, 24 megabytes of L3 cache, and zero hyperthreading. This is a slightly puzzling backward step compared to the last 13 generations of top end Intel chips. The previous U9 185H had 22 threads in total, and the i9 13900H had 20, so this new architecture has a lot of ground to make up. Perhaps even more interesting are the new Arc A140T integrated graphics. As well as having the usual industry leading hardware encoding and decoding for basically any video format, including H.265 and AV1, the new iGPU also has something to offer for gamers – XMX instruction support. This means it can use the true ML powered version of XESS upscaling, which is closer in quality to Nvidia's DLSS than the software based version that previous ARC iGPUs have been stuck with. XCSS isn't as widely available as DLSS, but if you're willing to get your hands dirty with Optiscaler, you should be able to make use of high quality XCSS upscaling in games that don't otherwise support it. The mini PC in question is the Geekom IT15 that was provided free of charge for this review. And it's somewhat classic in terms of design, sticking to the old school Intel NUC form factor and offering some respectable connectivity options while not really standing out. There are two Type C ports, which are both USB 4. There are four Type A's, three of which are 3.2 Gen 2's, and one is a plain Gen USB 2. The single RJ45 port is 2.5 gigabit. There's some Wi-Fi 7 and Bluetooth 5.4 for wireless connectivity, and the pair of HDMI ports mean that it can support up to four displays simultaneously, but there's no display ports except via the two Type-C ports. There's also something I love to see, an SD card slot for importing photos and videos from a camera, though the other port I like to see an Oculink for attaching high performance eGPUs is sadly absent from this model. Internally, both the RAM and NVMe SSD are socketed and therefore upgradable, but there's not a whole lot of room to expand with extra drives. The only way of adding more internally is a B key slot for 42mm SATA drives, which aren't exactly common or cheap. There's what looks like a 2.5 inch SSD bracket but that's probably a hangover from earlier devices using the same chassis. Even if you stick an SSD in the slot, there's nowhere on the motherboard to plug it in. Somewhat ingeniously, the engineers have found a use for this now vestigial drive bracket. The included SSD has a thermal pad on it, so the former bracket now contributes to cooling the NVMe SSD. Starting with a few synthetics, we can already see the downsides to the tiny form factor. Under the stress of a 10 minute Cinebench run, the 285H throttles quickly. It's pretty warm here in the UK right now, yes that actually happens. The ambient temp in my room was around the 28 degree mark, and I've turned the system fan up to the performance profile to keep things as cool as possible, but the CPU still briefly passes 100 degrees before throttling back, with temp settling in around the 90 mark, and clocks dropping from around 3.8GHz to around 32 
this has an impact on performance. The Cinebench 24 run hits a multi-core score of 986, barely ahead of the 185H and a little behind both the Ryzen 365 and HX370. In R23, I have more historical data to compare to, and despite boasting the strongest single-core score, the multi-core result is now behind the 185H and only just ahead of the older Ryzen 8845HS. Geekbench 6 seems to play to the new chip's strengths, perhaps in part by being less intensive and more real-world. Both single and multi-core scores top the charts in the CPU test, but the GPU score isn't quite as impressive. In OpenCL, the new ARC A140T beats the older model by a fairly slim gap and still falls behind the Radeon 890M, and in Vulkan, it's competing with the old 780M. In Time Spy, the Intel chip is within the margin of error of the Ryzen HX370, and that's mostly down to the fact that 3D Mark scores are weighted in favour of the GPU. The ARC 140T iGPU scores a few points lower in the graphics test, but significantly higher in the CPU test. The Blender test isn't at all flattering to the Ultra 9, or Intel in general. The test finishes in just under 6 minutes, a few seconds faster than its immediate predecessor, and a few seconds slower than a Ryzen 7 7840HS from two generations ago. Of course, synthetics are all well and good, but I wanted to know how these things game, and I'm sure you do too. Apex Legends isn't the easiest game to consistently benchmark over time, but in general I've found Intel chips fall below AMDs, and that seems to be the case here. At just under 100 FPS, the 285H is about 50% faster than the old 13th Gen i9, but about 25% slower than a Ryzen 9 365. The margins are similar in Counter-Strike 2, but honestly, I've yet to find a mini PC that can give what I'd call a truly satisfying experience in this game, and the IT15 doesn't change that. Maybe it's okay for some casual play now and again, but the inconsistent performance and general feeling of latency is probably just going to be frustrating in the long run. Player Unknown's Battlegrounds Battlegrounds isn't a game I often feature in videos. I know Fortnite is far more popular, but I gave up benchmarking that game ages ago due to it being a persistently stuttering mess. For what it's worth, PUBG is also a bit messy in that regard, and aesthetically it seems to have turned into one of its own knockoffs at some point in the last five years or so, but you can have a non-terrible time at 1080p low. I did try increasing anti-aliasing and texture quality, but that saw the average drop from the 80s to the high 60s, so you might want to find your own ideal settings here. Marvel Rivals is not a great match for the 285H, at least not in this particular case. Native 1080p with everything manually turned to low is still short of 30fps, at least according to the built-in benchmark. XCSS can help to a degree, and at the balanced setting, which is approximately the same resolution as FSR performance, it's averaging just below 50. But the highlights around players don't seem to be upscaled or even anti-aliased, so they make every character look like they're being astrally projected from a PS2 game. Channel regulars will know I'm a bit of a Star Wars nerd, but Battlefront 2 is a game I actually steered clear of before now. It's enjoying a bit of a resurgence in 2025, so I thought it would be worth giving it a go, especially as it's dirt cheap on Steam right now. Performance at 1080p low is decent, achieving the desired 60 plus average, but with plenty of drops even as far as the 40s. This will vary according to the map, but what's particularly unwelcome is a bunch of visual glitches that make some parts of the game, including some rooms in the Camino map, absolutely painful to play. This is perhaps a driver oversight by Intel, or it's EA's fault. They have notoriously abandoned this game after all. To test out XCSS further, I've loaded up Spider-Man Remastered. 
No, I'm not a Marvel fanboy, it's just one of the games I know supports Intel upscaling natively, and I thought more recent games would be a bit too heavy for this iGPU. At the medium quality preset, performance is decent even at native 1080p, and turning on XCSS even up as far as quality, which is about equivalent to FSR balanced, is quite acceptable. Unfortunately, getting close to 60fps means dropping to XCSS balanced, which again means 540p internally, and while image quality is actually not bad at all considering, there's a few motion artifacts that stand out. Also, I noticed some issues with texture pop-in, but I've seen this before in this game on a number of low-spec graphics cards and iGBUs. We're not lacking in video memory, but it may be down to the speed of that memory. This is DDR5 5600, which is almost as fast as Sodim memory gets, so short of going with soldered memory, there's not a whole lot of room for improvement. If you really want better visuals and performance than this, you might want to look into pairing the IT15 with a Thunderbolt eGPU. Physically, the small, lightweight chassis of the IT15 is quite appealing for this type of device, and I'm a fan of the easy access to the interior, but the largely plastic, fingerprint magnet exterior is a bit of a put-off compared to the more Apple-like metal shells of the A and XT series. The lack of extra internal NVMe expansion ports is something that's common across the Geekom range, even the larger Max series, so anyone looking to use a mini PC as a NAS is either going to have to try and find a decent capacity 42mm SATA drive, or else tie up one of those USB ports with an external one. Neither option is ideal. For the price, I'd like to have seen more flexibility, especially as there are other mini PCs out there that have two or more NVMe slots and still have powerful processors. All of which leads me to the price. The Ultra 9 285H version of the IT15 sells for 999 British pounds or 1199 US dollars, though there are always vouchers and promos that make it just that bit harder to assess their value properly. At the stated price, it is the most powerful and most expensive mini PC in the Geekom lineup. And while it beats the CPUs in models like the A8 in terms of productivity, I don't know if it's worth paying the extra. The Arc graphics are great to have, especially for QuickSync and the upgraded XCSS upscaler, but in terms of raw gaming performance, the older Radeons are on par or better, and FSR 3 is a worse upscaler, but not that much worse. I'd be interested in seeing what the 285H could do with a bigger heatsink, and coincidentally, I may have another 285H mini PC coming to review soon, so keep an eye out on the channel for that. In the meantime, thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.